Heavenly Father, we come boldly before your throne of grace, petitioning that you will give us of your spirit as we open your word and we look at uh, some biblical reasons why we go through some tough times. And Father, I pray that this will be an inspiration to those watching and listening just as much as it was an inspiration to me. I pray that it will give courage and strength to those that are going through tough times, which really is probably just about all of us at this point. And Father, I, I pray that you will uh, continue to lead us and guide us, give us hope, give us strength. And I pray that you touch my lips with a call from off your altar as I, as I present your, your thoughts through my body language, my words, and my tone of voice. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been through some, some tough times in my life. There were some time, there was one time in particular early on in my, my Christian experience where I was, I was this close to giving up or losing my faith, giving up my faith because I didn't understand what faith was actually. Um, but also later on, I went through and, and my, really my whole is, uh, ex Christian experience has been one testimony after another of God's leading and God's overcoming. But there was another particular experience that really rattled me. Um, and it, 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 things got so hard. And it was clearly supernatural. There's no question about this. All these things happening were, were clearly supernatural. And I got, was brought to my wit's end to the point of almost breaking. And from that experience, I won't, this isn't the sermon, so I won't go into that, but part of that experience, or the, the result of what I learned there was true righteousness by faith, the ability to uh, do what I can, but give the rest to God because there's, I can't control everything. That's up to him. Um, and so I, ultimately, I really, really learned righteousness by faith, or let me rephrase that. That was one of the steps of my learning, righteousness by faith. I'm still learning righteousness by faith. But, you know, I look back at that and, you know, I, I, I started thinking, why do we go through hard times? You know, the, the, the typical answer is, well, you've done something wrong. Just like the, the, the disciples asking, Lord, who is it that sinned, this man or his parents? Speaking of the, the man who was born blind at birth. Um, so, yes, sin can cause those things, but maybe there's other things that can cause those things that can cause these hardships. And, you know, so I started looking at that and I was like, you know, I don't, I don't just buy the, the, well, you've done something wrong. Maybe that's the case, but there are others as well. So I want to look at that, but it, it becomes even harder for me when I see someone else going through hard times. And how do I, how do I help them? There, there's some times that I don't know what to say or what to do. So I, I really started looking into this to see what all the Bible says. And I came up with four things, not saying that this is, there are only four reasons. There may be more reasons. Maybe, maybe you as the viewer can come up with other reasons and, and post them underneath other reasons that you may see why we go through tough times uh, to help encourage people. So feel free to post underneath if, if you see other reasons. Uh, but what I found were these four reasons and they're not just reasons, but they're also, um, steps, steps to purification. Uh, so in other words, you're not going to get to step number three or reason number three without first having gone through a hard times number one and two uh, and so on. Even with, with the fourth, you've got to go through the first three first. So these are a, a growing experience. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. In other words, the difference between a just man and a, and a, uh, a wicked man is a wicked man falls into mischief and stays there, but a just man falls and gets back up. That's the difference. The just man gets back up. So I, I hope that these reasons give you courage to get back up. Don't When, when you fall into hard times or, or anything like that, don't stay down get back up. One reason that we may be going through tough times is, like I mentioned before, discipline for doing something wrong. You know, we can, we can do something wrong and we can be forgiven for that wrong, but that doesn't mean that God will always take away the consequences for that or the results of that wrong. Let me explain. So, uh, Let's say, you know, I climb up on the roof of the house and I jump off. Well, that's a dumb decision. You know, I'm, I'm 
really, I'm self-murdering myself by doing that. I'm doing damage to my body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I shouldn't be doing that. And so that's a sin. And God can forgive me of that sin, but that doesn't mean that he's going to instantly cure my broken leg. Or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I have to live with the consequences oftentimes. Now, can God take those consequences away? Yes, he can, if he so chooses. But living with those consequences can be a disciplinary action to help us not ever do it again. So if I jump off the roof and I should have broken my leg and I don't, and I'm like, wow, look at that, I can do it again. If I smoke and I don't ever get cancer or I don't ever have problems, I, hey, I can just keep right on smoking. So the consequences of these things can, it can be a, a disciplinary action. A discipline for doing something wrong. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 to 6 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I want to stop there for just a moment. You have not yet resisted unto blood. You may be tired of this fight. You may be tired of falling and getting back up, falling and getting back up. But brothers and sisters, you haven't resisted sin unto blood. This is, this is Paul's argument. So maybe you're wearied, but just think about what Jesus went through. If anybody had the excuse of being weary and falling into sin, he did. <laughs> but he didn't, have, he didn't use that excuse because it's not an excuse. And that's what Paul is saying. You have not yet resisted under blood, so you really don't have an excuse. Get back up and keep going. He continues, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. So, here's... Uh, a promise, if you will. You know, if you're going through hard times and it's because of a disciplinary action or a discipline, you've done something wrong, take courage. I mean, God loves you. He, he, he chastens those whom he loves. So take courage there. Um, you know, I, I grew up with an older brother and older sister. And my older sister had just a little bit of a... Um, a, a stubborn streak in her, <laughs> um, you know, and she could be caught red-handed doing something. And my dad would say, did, uh, and her name, uh, well, he would say, did you just do this? And, you know, she, she could just, he could have seen her do it. She could have been caught red-handed and she, nope, I didn't do that. <laughs> and so he would, you know, he would give her plenty of warning. Look, if you don't, if you don't fess up to this, I'm going to whip you. I didn't do it. And so he said, all, all right, I, I, I saw you do it. I didn't do it. Okay, so he'd, he'd spank her. It doesn't hurt. And so he'd spank her again a little bit harder and she'd, you, you could see her flinch and doesn't hurt. And so he'd, all right, so he'd spank her harder and he's tears rolling down her face and, and she's, doesn't hurt. And I'm sitting there going, what are you thinking? <laughs> I learned from that. I learned from that as soon as, as soon as either, either one of their hands, my, my mom or dad, as soon as the hand went up, I started wailing and wall, you know, ah, that hurts, that hurts. <laughs> I learned from that. I wasn't going to say it doesn't hurt because I saw that you got whipped harder. <laughs> but it, it didn't. I, I may have helped a little bit with my dad, but it really worked with my mom, not maybe maybe a little bit with my dad. <laughs> but I learned from that. You know, so when we're being disciplined, learn from it. Don't say, don't be, don't be defiant against God and, and resist it. Otherwise, you're going to have to come back around to that again and each time you come back around it will be harder and harder and harder and it will hurt more and more and more until you finally learn so don't be defiant take the discipline understand that this discipline is given to you out of love by god so one reason that maybe we go through hard times is is because we've done something wrong and and 
and we're receiving a, a disciplinary action, even if it's simply a consequence of sin. Another reason that maybe we go through, you, that well, not maybe, but that we do go through tough times is this is process of sanctification. <laughs> sanctification. Um, strengthening the faith muscle. You know, if we're we're all too often, we are lukewarm and we're comfortable right where we're at. And God's like, you've got my son, my daughter, you've got so far to go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. You know, just keep moving. But we're so comfortable where we're at that God has to poke us and prod us. <laughs> and sometimes he has to put rough times before us in order to, to shake us awake. And to get us to move you know he wants our faith our faith needs to be so strong in order to make it through the end times and he can look at us and see this person's faith is not strong enough and they're not strengthening it they're not doing faith workouts on their own so therefore I'm going to have to apply weight to them you know I always equate the, the muscle to faith or the faith to to a muscle and you strengthen it by by doing workouts and if I know that in, uh, you know, at such and such time, I'm going to need to bench press 500 pounds, you, you can look at me. I need to start right now <laughs> because it's going to be a long time before I'm bench pressing 500 pounds. I don't want to wait till the week before this test comes up. And if, you know, for me to bench press 500 pounds, because it's not going to happen, I'm going to fail that test. And the test that I'm talking about is, is salvation. If we don't have faith, to make it through, we're going to lose our salvation. And God knows where our faith is at. And we, like I said, we tend not to step out in faith on our own. So he is to poke us and prod us. So sometimes going through hard times, it's a process of sanctification. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep my body and I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. Now, there's so much there that Paul's talking about. But, uh, so let's let's look at the, the, the visualization of the Olympics. And, and at this time, the Olympics had kind of just started. And most of them ran, you know, did the Olympics with no clothes on. Um, and when the winner received a wreath, a re this wreath was a live wreath and it, it, it rotted over time. It was corruptible. And we look at Olympians now, you know, the, people don't just go to the Olympics and gain the gold medal for, you know, a couple hours uh, of work a day. No, they spend their whole lifetime day in and day out training for this. But what are they doing? They're gaining something that is corruptible. And Paul is saying, look, they put all this work in to gain something corruptible how much more important is salvation? But yet, what do we do as Christians? We tend to want to be couch potato Christians. We're lukewarm. We don't put effort into Christianity, not like we should. And Paul is saying, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fighting, but not as one that's beating at the air, not, not sh uh, shadow boxing. I'm fighting a real thing is what he's saying. And if he didn't do this, then he would be a castaway. So he can't, he's, he's practicing what he's preaching, in other words. You know, we're, we're not going to win the, win the race by sitting on the couch and, and eating potato chips. We need to train. We need to train. We look at the Olympian, just look at the Olympian, at the Olympic athlete. They should give us inspiration. But you know what? The Olympic athlete should be looking at us Christians and going, wow, look at how much they train. You know, maybe I should train like that. But unfortunately, it's the other way around. We're having to use them as examples. 
1 John 2, 6 says, He that saith he abides in Christ ought himself also to walk even as Christ walked. I've added Christ in there just for clarification purposes. But if we say we're, we abide in Christ, in other words, we, we say we're Christians, then we should walk as Christ walked. Did he have an easy life here? No, he didn't. Isaiah 53, verse 3, 3 and 4, and also verse 7. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. So Jesus, when he goes through these trials, he's not whining and complaining about it. But he went through trials like we will never experience, brothers and sisters. We will never experience it. Hebrews 5.8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. If we say we are a Christian, then we are to walk as he walked. How did he learn obedience? He learned, learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So also should we learn obedience by the things that we suffer. Maybe we have done something wrong and we are suffering as a consequence of sin. We are receiving a disciplinary action, but that may not also that may not be. Maybe we've already been through that process and now we're in the process of sanctification and we're learning obedience by things uh, that we're suffer that we're suffering. In other words, again, we're strengthening that faith muscle. We've, there's coming a time where we've got to bench press 500 pounds, brothers and sisters. We need to start strengthening those muscles now. And that's what God's doing. He's putting us through that. There's a story about Booker T. Washington in his, uh, I believe it was an autobiography. It's been a while since I've uh, looked at it, but I believe it was an autobiography. But there's a story in there. You know, Booker T. Washington accomplished a lot, accomplished a lot as an individual. I mean, he broke so many ceilings, glass ceilings, that it wasn't funny. As a, as a young black man, he really stepped out and he led in ways that people didn't like. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't like what he was doing, but he stepped out and he set an example. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for him to go through this. He had what he called good old-fashioned Yankee grit. And where did he learn that? Because he wasn't a Yankee. He was born in the South. Um, he learned it after slavery when he was a young boy. He went to work for um, this uh, in, in the South. Uh, I think he was a general. It's been a while since I've, I've read this story uh, or looked at this. But I think it was a general. But he went to, to work for the general's wife who was a Yankee, a red-headed Yankee woman. <laughs> and she didn't let him get away with things. She kept his feet to the fire. She saw promise in him. And she wasn't going to baby him. She wasn't going to just give him what he wanted. She taught him to work. She taught him what he later called good old-fashioned Yankee grit because she was that Yank red-headed Yankee woman. And so when you know he earned all this money to go to school while he worked for this uh, Yankee woman, <laughs> but then there was an emergency on his family with his family, and so he ended up having to give all this money to his family. But he decided he was going to go to school anyways. And so he goes to school. He makes it there on just uh, just pennies but he's got nothing left to pay for school and the teacher saw that the the person that was um you know signing people up saw that he had no money knew that he had no money and so he was like you know i'm not i'm not i'm not going away <laughs> he stayed there he had yankee grit he stayed right there until she came out and said booker if you will just go ahead and sweep that room in there so he jumps up and he runs into that room and he sweeps it and he sweeps it and he sweeps it again. He swept it multiple times. Then he, then he went through and he dusted and he didn't just dust over top of things. He dusted underneath things. He cleaned that room spotless. And so when this, this lady comes in, 
she puts on her white glove and she starts putting her hands above everything looking for dust and there's no dust anywhere and she says how did you know I just asked you to sweep this room how did you know that I was gonna check every little thing and he said ah you just reminded me of that Yankee woman but he learned Yankee grit from these experiences his life was not easy as a youngster but he learned Yankee grit from that and as a result he grew up and became uh, a very not just famous man but he did so many things to help people so also with us we God sometimes will allow us to go through hard times in order to strengthen us not necessarily because we've done something wrong although we may go through hard times because of that too but the next step is is the process of sanctification so step number three or the third reason that we may have uh, go through hard times is to be a witness in Daniel chapter 3 verses 13 to 18 we see something very powerful it says then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach Meshach and Abednego then they brought these men before the king Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them is it true O Shadrach Meshach and Abednego do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up now if ye be ready that at that time ye hear the sound of the cornet flute harp sackbut psaltery and dulcimer and all kinds of other music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well but if you worship not ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands Shadrach Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we are not careful to answer thee in this matter in other words we don't even have to discuss this if it be so if it be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand O king but if not be it known unto thee O king that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up now this is a parallel to the Sunday law that is coming up so just think about this as a parallel and what will come but I want you to also notice uh, well there's so oh boy there's so many things I'd like to draw out of this example um, one is they didn't know if God would save them or not but they were determined they were going to stand on the law God's law no matter what they were going to be a witness for God no matter what even if they died so be it that's God's hands he's got the ability to save them or not so if, if they're not saved then that's up to God that's that's his problem not theirs um, but also what I really want to draw out of this though is Nebuchadnezzar became uh, a convert I was going to say Christian, but that wouldn't be 100% accurate. Um, Christian as we would know it, but he became a convert. If you look back, did, did, did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did they need discipline for having done something wrong? Is this why they went through this tough time? No. Um, had they done things wrong? Yeah, but that's not what was going on here. Was this a process of sanctification for them? Uh, yeah, it may be to some degree, but I think the biggest reason um, they already had determined in their mind in their heart that they were not going to bow so I think that this was a witness to the king and God saw Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and he saw Nebuchadnezzar and he wanted to reach Nebuchadnezzar and he just he de decided the best way to do it I, I don't want to try to put myself in God's position and, and theorize but he evidently decided that the best way to do it here was to take Shadrach Meshach and Abednego who he knew would not fall and put them in a position where they would be tested and tried to their uttermost for a witness to Nebuchadnezzar
Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. This witness that is to be preached in all the world is not necessarily a verbal preaching. It's a witness of our lives. When we come into hard times, what do we do when we get into those hard times? Do we whine? Do we moan? Do we groan? Do we yell? Do we shout? Do we complain? Do we point fingers? Or do we go through it with peace, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You see, brothers and sisters, when we have Christ within, the hope of glory, we, we have a hope of glory, and we don't have to worry about what's going on around us. We can leave that to God. We can go through these tough times saying, you know what, God? I don't know why exactly I'm going through this, but I trust you. And so we can have a peace going through this. And that peace will touch people. When we were... Um, uh, censored, I'll just call it a censorship meeting, although it was, it was a whole lot more than a censorship meeting. But when my wife and I were censored years ago for our belief in the Father and Son, um, we were brought before the, the council. And I had just stepped down as the head elder, and so the, the, next, uh, the, the second elder then became the head elder. Um, and so in this, this council, the, the, the meeting, boy, we were reamed, and we were reamed hard. And it was our best friends that did it. Um, and it, that was really hard for us to, to deal with. But when we went in, before we went in, I heard very clearly, just hold your peace. Hold your peace. You know, I could have totally destroyed them theologically. I knew it, and they knew it, and the conference knew it. <laughs> That's why the conference told them they weren't allowed to study this with us. They couldn't even bring up any reasons why we were being censored, other than we didn't believe in the fundamental fundamental beliefs. But most of the people didn't even know which ones. Um, anyways, but there was one person who stood outside the door. She refused to come in. Uh, she, she didn't want to be a part of what was going to happen. And, and she knew that it wasn't going to be pretty. And later she came to us and said, uh, you know, I was just totally amazed that to that whole meeting, even though people are yelling at you and, and making nasty comments, the both of you just sat there quietly with such peace. And at one point, you know, the, the elder, he was all shaky and nervous. I even, I even, you know, patted him on the back and I said, you know, don't worry about it. Just let's just go forward with, with the meeting, with what needs to be done here. And I, you know, I was trying to calm him down. And, you know, this was such a witness for her. And at the time, oh, I can tell you, brothers and sisters, I can tell you, I wanted to throw Bible verses. I wanted to throw Ellen White. I wanted to totally destroy them in their theology. And I could have easily. But I just, I, I knew God said, just hold your peace. I will do what needs to be done. You trust in me and let me deal with this. And that was such a powerful witness to this individual. You know, there, there, uh, just, I, w I want to give one more example. Um, just the other day, I, you know, I was, I was preaching on actually uh, vaccines, Ellen White and the Pioneers. And, you know, I made the statement that God's methods can bring 100% success or can give 100% success. And in our Zoom meeting there, when I was preaching at the end, the discussion kind of came up and, you know, one brother spoke up and said, you know, my wife followed the health message to the best of our knowledge, but yet she still died of cancer. And he said, I, I just want everyone to know that stay strong. You don't blame God. Do the best that you can and, and put everything in God's hands. And, you know, I would just, the testimony that this brother gave 
was so powerful to me. I don't know how it affected everyone else, but it was so powerful to me. And it was very clearly a witness to the king. This experience that, that he went through. Now, I, I have no idea, you know, why they went through this hard time. Why she died. I don't know those things. And, and even if I knew them very intimately, I still probably wouldn't know those things. I'm not God. But the powerful thing was his testimony. And the testimony that he gave was, was such a powerful witness. So maybe, maybe this happened. And, and again, I, I don't know exactly the situation, but, but maybe this happened so that his witness could save a life or save many lives. Because brothers and sisters, we're going to come to some very, very hard times. And it may, not look, it may look like we're not going to make it. Maybe some of us, most of us won't make it. But we need to trust in God regardless. Just like the, the three Hebrew worthies, we need to say, God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, I still will not bow to your gods. So one reason is discipline for doing something wrong. The next is the process of sanctification. This is, this is another reason why we will go through some hard times. And we need to have gone through the disciplinary action and learned the process of sanctification or be learning the process of sanctification in order to take on step number three, which is witnessing to others, being able to go through these things with peace because we've been through them before and God always carried us through. He's always been there and he always will be. We trust that, we know that, and we have faith in that. So therefore we have peace and that peace shines forth to those around us. When you go through tough times, rely on God, not just so that you can have peace, but so that you can be a witness so that others can look and go, wow, so-and-so is going through this tough time, but they just, they've got all this peace. I want what they have. Reason number four, or step number four, however you want to look at this, is a witness to the universe. Not just to someone around, but also to the universe. Remember the great controversy. Always look at everything from the, from the spectacles of the great controversy. Job, in Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12, we see something very powerful, and then we'll read verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 as well. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From go going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. In other words, Satan was saying, This is my domain, so I have a right to be here. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? I want to stop there for just a moment. Do we think that Job may need disciplinary action? No. Um, do we? Does he need, according to what we just read, do you think he needs the process of sanctification? Well, everybody can, can take the next step, but um, he already fears God and eschews evil, He's an upright and perfect man, so I don't think that would be the reason that he's about to go through some tough times. Is this to be a witness to those around him? I think probably so, but I think there's a bigger reason yet, and that's a witness to the universe. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And from there we go through and we see all that the devil does, and it's just devastating. If I've never been through tough times like that, period. And I, I hope not to. Uh, if the Lord sees fit, then so be it. He
He will, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, and so I will rely on him, but I, I, I hope and pray that that's not necessary. But we go on down to chapter 2 now, verses 1 to 9, and then the last part of verse 10. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Again, saying, This is my territory. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shard to scrape himself withal. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. And then the last part of verse 10 says, And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Job was being a witness in the great the scheme of the great controversy. Job was not just witnessing to those around him, but Job was witnessing to all the worlds. All the worlds were watching this whole scenario, this whole thing play out. And God, this was a witness to all of them saying, if man abides by my law and fulfills those, law by, those laws by my power, then he really is worthy to save. Revelation 14, 5, it speaks of another group that will be like Job. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This is the 144,000, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to go into detail, but step four of this process is the 144,000. Because the 144,000 will have no guile in their mouth. They will stand before God without the need of an intercessor. And they will witness to all the universe that the power of God in man means we can keep the law of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So after we have suffered a while, we shall be made perfect. So brothers and sisters, you know, when you go through a hard time, not, not if, when you go through a hard time, do this not only for witness to those around you, but remember that you are a spectacle unto all the worlds. Everybody is looking down at humanity and saying, oh, look at the disgust down there. Can those people really be saved? I'm afraid that if, if God brings them here, that they're just going to perpetuate sin here, and I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not so sure they can be saved. And God is saying, look at my servant Job. God, in the end, will be saying, Look at the 144,000. We are to be a witness to all the worlds. Some years back, um, we lived in a, a single wide. It was an old single wide trailer. Actually, you could see, uh, you could see daylight through places in the trailer and not just the windows. Uh, places where you're not supposed to see daylight. And this was in Wyoming, where, where it would hit, you know, 20, 30 below at times. Um, 
but it, this tr trailer obviously wasn't very mouse proof um, and so there was one day I don't even remember where Christy was but she wasn't there uh, I was at I, I got home from work I uh, you know so I, I pop open the shower curtain you know I jump in the in the tub to take a shower I close the shower curtain I turn the hot water on you know and I've squatted down feeling the water and once it gets hot then I start adding cool I get everything right and I pop the um, the thing to make the shower come on and I step back and of course the water hits me and just as I'm standing there just as the water hits me I, I, I see something out of the corner of my eye actually the lower of my eye I see something dart between my feet and I'm like what and so I look down and and I I'm like whoa there's a mouse in the tub where did he come from I so I jump out of the shower I turn the water off and I'm looking in there and it dawned on me that uh, as I came into the bathroom th the mouse had gotten stuck in the tub and he couldn't jump out every time he would try to jump out the, the curvature of the tub meant that he couldn't get close enough to the tub to jump up so he had to jump from way over here and he still couldn't get enough traction from over here because it was too far so he just never could make it I, I know because I saw him uh, try to get out after that um, but so he's stuck in the tub and I come in so what's he do he goes down the drain to hide and he's evidently hanging on to the drain as I've got the water going you know he's just about drowning in there um, and so as soon as I popped it up to for the water to go up the shower that gave him just a split moment where the water stopped flowing down the drain and he was able to come up out and so I'm going whoa you know so I go I, run, I go get our two cats um, one was a really good mouser the other one uh, she was uh, well she was not so good of a mouser <laughs> um, the, the best that she would do is she was quite large she would sit on the other cat when the other cat caught, it, caught a mouse and she would take it from her um, but I went and got both cats and I put them both in the tub thinking okay one of them is gonna get this mouse and oh I, I so wish this was before smartphones I so wish I would have had a smartphone to video this but um, so both cats are in there just kind of staring at the mouse and the, the mouse is huddled in the corner just not moving so the one cat who's not the greatest mouser she she gets bored really easily so she just hops out I mean she saw the mouse but she just hopped out and went on her way well the other cat standing there looking at the mouse going that's a mouse but why is it not running <laughs> and so she just crouched down well there was a I got out of the tub so fast <laughs> when I got out of the tub I ended up knocking the shampoo bottle into the tub and that shampoo bottle was sticking straight up and down perfect standing upright and so the cat's on one side of the tub and the mouse is on the other side of the tub well the mouse sees that shampoo bottle and it slowly walks to the shampoo bottle and hides behind the shampoo bottle it's the only thing it can hide behind because the cat's down by the the drain so it can't go down the drain so the cat walks slowly gets up and walks towards that shampoo bottle and so here's the shampoo bottle the mouse is on the one side the cat's over here and so the cat just kind of slowly peeks around and the mouse on the other side of the shampoo bottle looks up and sees the cat poking her head around there eye to eye there I mean they're they're only just a, you know a couple inches apart and so that mouse just slowly scoots around the other side of the you know and so the cats you know like this as the mouse scoots around this way so then the cat slowly comes around this way and so the mouse looks up and sees the cat almost nose to nose again and so the, the mouse just slowly backs up and they did this several times and I was like oh. <laughs> and so I reached out and I snatched that shampoo bottle out of the tub and I was like there now you got no place to hide now cat sick him <laughs> well the mouse looks up at the cat and slowly backs away from the cat it made no fast movement but slowly backed away from the cat so the cat's like I, the cat's trying to figure out what's going on with this mouse why is this mouse not scared you know the cat's instinct is to chase when something runs but if it doesn't run if you face down a lion for example I, don't don't try it because I'm no expert but I've seen people do it on TV let's say it that way <laughs> um, if you face down a lion a lion will stop if you run you're done 
I do know that with bears, uh, with grizzlies. Um, although you're best not to face them down either, but don't run because as soon as you run, you are bait. You are right there. You just told that, that predator that you are prey. Don't act like prey. And that's what this mouse was doing. He was not acting like prey. And so the cat's trying to figure it out. Is this mouse prey or is this mouse predator? And it wasn't sure. So the cat actually slowly backed up to the other side of the top. And I'm like, really? Well, when that happened, there became some distance. So the, the mouse decided that was his time to jump for it. So he jumped trying to get out of the tub. And of course, he didn't make it. He came really close, but he slid right back down in. And of course, that got the cat excited. So the cat stood up and started towards the mouse. And the mouse saw the, sees the cat, realizes there's no place to go. And so it sits up on its rear haunches. And so the, the cat slows down. Bear with me here. This is a long story, but it's really good. The cat slows down and just starts creeping towards the mouse. And the mouse, when the cat gets about a foot away, the mouse sitting on its haunches raises his front paws up like this. And so the cat stops for just a second, but then it keeps coming. And when the cat is literally only about two inches from the mouse, I see the mouse puff up, get a huge breath of air and lets out the loudest chirp I've ever heard a mouse let out. And the, that just freaked the cat out. The cat backed away really quick and went to the other end of the tub. And <laughs> you know what? I was just so impressed by that, that little mouse. I went and got a glove and I grabbed the mouse and I tossed it outside. <laughs> Uh, knowing that that mouse was probably just going to come right back in the house. It was cold. It was, it was below zero outside. Knowing that that mouse, that, that little mouse was going to go right under our house and right back up inside. But I just, you know, I just couldn't bear to kill that mouse. You know, I, I, this, for a split moment, I thought about throwing the mouse up against the house, you know, out from outside. When I got out, I, I thought about throwing it up against the house and killing it. Um, or flushing it down the toilet or, you know, drowning it. And I just, it's like, man, I just, I've got so much respect for this mouse. I was like, mouse, you got one more fighting chance, but you come back in the house, you're not going to get it again. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, the devil is like the cat. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour. But in the strength of Christ, if we sit back on our haunches, raise our front paws, and yell at him in the name of Christ, the lion has nothing to do but to back off. That mouse, at that time, was going through probably the hardest time up until its death, probably the hardest time that mouse had ever been through nor ever would go through. It faced down the lion. And believe me, brothers and sisters, the cat compared to the mouse was way bigger than me facing down any lion. It's, that was more like me facing down the devil. But so also we, in the strength of Christ, when we get into those hard times, let us bring glory to God by facing the devil right straight in his face and telling him to be gone. Face him in the strength of Christ, and he will have no choice but to leave. So there's four reasons that, that I see that we go through hard times. Not, not saying that this is all, but again, if you have another reason, please post it uh, below. But here's four reasons that I see that we, we go through hard times. One is because we've done something wrong. And we're receiving the consequences of that wrong. We're receiving a disciplinary action. Uh, number two, which is actually the next step also, is the process of sanctification. And so we know, or God knows, that we need to strengthen our faith, faith muscle. And we're very Laodicean. We're very comfortable right where we're at. We're not putting ourselves out there to trust in him to strengthen our faith muscle. So God's like, okay, here you go. I'm going to put you in a rough situation. I'm going to put some weight on you so that you learn to start building that faith muscle. Uh, number three, the third reason, and also the step number three in this process is 
we go through hard times as a witness for those around us. And how are we witnessing? Are we witnessing to the glory of God or not to the glory of God? How do we go through our hard, the hard times? Yelling, kicking, and screaming, blaming others? Or are we able to go through them with peace? See, when we go through them with peace, we're, we're being a witness to God. And then the fourth is a witness to the universe. Not just to those around us, but a witness to the universe. So, my appeal to you. We've all been through hard times, and many are going through hard times right now. My appeal to you is stay focused on the end goal, which is to bring glory to God. Stay focused on that end goal. And in the power of Christ, I can do all things, not some things, all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And God will not, uh, uh, he will deliver us from temptation and not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle. So he will tell the devil this far and no more. Because he knows where what we can and can't handle. So while you're going through these things, realize that you can handle it. But the only way you're really going to do it is to focus on Christ. Stay focused. My appeal is stay focused on the end goal to bring glory to God. If you're willing to do that, remember to keep that focus. If you want to say, God, I, help me. <laughs> Because I've made this commitment, but I, I forget. So if you're willing to, to be made willing, or if you're willing to do, and if you're willing to be reminded, or to be uh, brought back to this again, then I would ask that you would kneel with me in prayer that we may make this commitment to God to bring glory to Him regardless of what happens. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your blessings. And Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to go through hard times because I'm either learning uh, from consequences to not do something again or I'm gaining faith to strengthen my muscles or I'm witnessing for someone else or to someone else or I'm witnessing to the universe and so father I thank you for giving me that opportunity and I thank you more than anything that you are empowering me to go through these experiences. Father, I pray that you will empower everyone here to go through those experiences. Father, we have, we have some hard times coming before us that, that we can't even imagine. And if we're, we're struggling now, Father, we're not going to make it in those times unless we give all to you. So, Father, I, I just pray that we will give everything over to you, give everything into your hands, and that we will keep our focus. And the focus is to bring glory to you regardless of what happens. So I thank you, Father, for answering this, because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.